Hello, and welcome to Fantasy, Faith, and Physics. I'm your host, Mary Jane Rubenstein. This evening's debate is brought to you by the Institute for Arts and Ideas in partnership with Closer to Truth. Please find their interviews with some of the most foremost thinkers of our time at closertotruth.com. And now for some fantasy, faith, and physics. We think that we pursue the sciences solely for knowledge and truth, but is this a mistake? Untestable ideals like beauty have been baked into theories throughout the history of science. Paul Dirac, one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century, proclaimed, it is more important to have beauty in one's equations than to have them fit experiment. And recently, Roger Penrose described string theory as a fashion, quantum physics as a faith, and cosmic inflation as a fantasy, arguing that scientists suffer from the very same prejudices that affect the rest of us. Do we pursue science out of a pure desire for truth? Or should we accept that some, ex some assumptions, especially at the foundations of physics, are akin to religious beliefs dressed in mathematical language? Should we see science as simply another theology, or would that undermine the field of physics and the progress it has made over the past few centuries? We have, I am excited to tell you, invited four magnificent speakers to address these questions today. First, Juan Maldacena is world-renowned for his field-defining contributions to the foundations of string theory and quantum gravity. He works at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. Next, Sabina Hossenfelder is a theoretical physicist who specializes in quantum gravity. She's the author, among other things, of Existential Physics, A Scientist's Guide to Life's Biggest Questions. And then we have Max Tegmark, who is a pioneering physicist, cosmologist, and co computer scientist based at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is the author of Our Mathematical Universe, which argues that reality is fundamentally a mathematical structure. And finally, Michio Kaku is a famed futurist and co-founder of string field theory. He has spent his career inspired by the search for a theory of everything. His latest book is called Quantum Supremacy, How the Quantum Computer Revolution Will Change Everything. Okay, a quick word on format. We will open the conversation with two minute responses to an opening question, and then we'll move on to discuss three major themes pertaining to this opening question. All right, heading in, here we go. Opening question. We are going to start with Michio Kaku. Here we go, two minutes on the question. Professor Kaku, is mathematical beauty a guide to truth? Please. Well, mathematical beauty is a guide to truth, but not the sole guide, because ultimately we have to rely on experiment. However, when you look at the fundamental theories, without exception, every single fundamental theory has a description in terms of beautiful, gorgeous mathematics. So what do we mean by beauty to a physicist? Beauty is symmetry. So when you scramble objects, you get the same thing again after you do the manipulation. And so if you take a look at Einstein's theory of gravity, reparameterizations in space-time generates general relativity. If you take a look at the standard model, uh, SUN, special unitary groups and n dimensions, is the symmetry group of quarks, for example. Now, hypothetically, if you want to win a Nobel Prize in physics, or at least be a contender, your theory has to at least explain three things. First, your theory would have to incorporate Einstein's theory of gravity, which, as I said before, has a beautiful symmetry behind it. Second, the standard model. Your theory would have to explain quarks and neutrinos and electrons and all the zoo of subatomic particles that we see in our atom smashers. That's the second thing that your theory has to, has to explain. Third, anomalies and divergences. If you simply get a sheet of paper, write Einstein's theory, try to quantize it, what happens? It blows up in your face because of the fact that there's something missing, a cancellation mechanism to cancel the divergences. Now, so far, the only theory which can do all three is string theory. Now, that doesn't mean it's correct. Who knows? 
Maybe there's a higher theory someplace. But the only theory that can give a reasonable explanation of all three characteristics of a theory of everything is string theory. Now, of course, there are competing theories, but they all fall down at some point. They have anomalies. They diverge. They don't have electrons. They don't have matter as we know it. There's always something wrong with one of these theories. And so far, the only theory which can pass these is string theory. Now, of right. course, people, of course, can have their own opinions about this thing. Some people are critical. But when I was a child, we used to play a game. And the game was put up or shut up. That is, if you say something, try to top it. Try to say something even better or keep your mouth shut. So my attitude is very simple. You don't have to believe in the string theory at all. You can believe in another theory. But that other theory has to satisfy these three criteria that I just laid out. That, to me, is the acid test of whether you're embarking upon the true road to understanding the universe. If you can't do it, then, well, maybe you should shut up. Okay, thank you so much. Michio Kaku has thrown down. Um, let's move, if we can, to Sabina Hossenfelder. Can you answer the question, please? Address the question. Is mathematical beauty a guide to truth? I think I'm going to go with definitely, maybe. <laughs> so uh, I think we develop our sense of mathematical beauty through experience. In physics, we gain this experience from the theories that we work with. And this shapes our sense of beauty. I think it's often a sense that can't be formulated in concrete mathematical requirement, re requirements. It's rather, it's rather a gut feeling, a sense for what works and what doesn't work. And that's valuable exactly because we can't strictly formulate it. And I also think this is why some people are drawn to physics instead of mathematics, because you can bring in this intuition, this gut feeling. But this sense of beauty only helps us as long as we stay in that corner of mathematics, which we have experience with. If we're looking for a completely new theory that might use entirely different mathematics, it won't be of any use. We have to get there by other means. But once we get there, we develop a newfound sense of beauty. And this has happened several times in the history of physics. For example, Kepler's elliptical orbits were once thought of as ugly. So was the idea that the universe expands or quantum mechanics. But we don't say that today anymore. We have developed a new sense of beauty. So I think mathematical beauty can be helpful in cases when the new theory resembles the previous ones. But if that isn't the case, it can stand in the way. String theory is a cautious example. Physicists think it's beautiful because it conforms to their sense of beauty that they have developed from the existing theories. That doesn't mean it's right, though. And then there are alternatives like loop quantum gravity that many physicists think are ugly because it uses very different mathematics, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Max Tegmark, is mathematical beauty a guide to truth? I'm going to go with yes. <laughs> and I want to take a little historical perspective here. Of course, already in ancient times, thinkers like Plato and others felt that there was something truly beautiful about physics, about nature, and even saw mathematics and music and in the world around us. Since then, I think we've learned two main things, one from studying physics and one more recently from studying artificial intelligence. Uh, from studying physics, we've discovered ever more beautiful patterns, not just rotational symmetry, translational symmetry, time translation symmetry, and, and so on, which were known for a very long time, but also new ones, like what Michio Kaku referred to, so-called gauge symmetries that involve properties of elementary particles, etc., and Emmy Noether showed us this beautiful relationship between symmetries and things that are more permanent in nature, <laughs> stay conserved. So absolutely, there, there's something there, and we kept finding more. But artificial intelligence has very recently also shed light on what we even, as intelli what intelligent beings even get drawn to and, and find interesting in the world around them, which is, I think, very deeply related. 
And AI, if you have some data set with a lot of numbers and you can explain that data set with much fewer numbers, you're like, ah, this is great. That is actually often used even as a measure of intelligence, how much you can compress the data. And that's only possible if there are patterns in the data that, that you've uncovered. And uh, I think to me, something now feels very beautiful, even if it isn't in the traditional sense of being symmetric, but if, if you just find patterns and structure there. For example, there I once pulled out a book in an, an old library shelf with about 100,000 numbers that measured the wavelengths of spectral lines coming out of atoms. We can now compute all of those 100,000 numbers from three numbers in the Schrodinger equation. That's also beauty in this AI sense, where you get way more out of the theory that, than you put into it. Great. Thank you so much. And finally, Juan Malacena, um, can you please let us know whether in your world, mathematical beauty is a guide to truth? Well, I think beauty is a bit in the eye of, eye of the beholder. So I think that um, mathematical and physical consistency is a guide to truth. And by, by mathematical consistency, I mean the internal consistency of equations. And by physical consistency, I mean that it reduces to the known physics in the appropriate regimes. So here we are talking about fundamental theory. So physical consistency includes reducing to semi-classical general relativity and also to the standard model of particle physics. I guess more generally, we could demand that it reduces to general relativity plus some quantum theory, not necessarily that of the standard model. Now, in the past, it, as, as we discovered deeper theories, we found that they are in some sense simpler. Um, in the case of the standard model and gravity, they are also based on something called the gauge principle, which involves a certain, let's say, so-called symmetry. It's not quite a symmetry in the standard sense, but um, to the extent that symmetry is associated psychologically to beauty, then you could call them beautiful. Mm -hmm. And for some reasons, sometimes people say that theories which have a larger gauge group are more beautiful. But this is a bit subjective. We also have concepts like simplicity, as let's say in Occam's razor. So sometimes simpler theories are called beautiful. I mean, I think the bottom line is that the theory is beautiful when it works. And, uh, and by works, I mean, it's mathematically and physically consistent. Now, of course, whether theory is true or not is decided on ex by experiment. So if it agrees, but if, if in order for a theory to agree with experiment, it probably has to be as a necessary condition, physically and mathematically consistent. Um, so I think those two conditions are a guide. Um, and I, I will also end up here, we're talking about beauty of theories, but I, I would also say that sometimes experiments are beautiful. So they're beautiful when they manage to uh, do something seemingly impossible. For example, you could say that the detectors of gravity waves are be beautiful in this sense. Thank you. This is amazing because you have provided a brilliant transition into our first theme question, uh, which kind of intensifies the opening one. Um, Juan, when you say a theory is beautiful when it works, which is to say mathematically and physically, um, what do we do if these two are at odds with one another? Um, our opening description cited Paul Dirac as saying, it is more important to have beauty in one's equations than to have them fit experiment. Um, was he right about that? Uh, Max, I'm going to send it over to you first. It's more important to have beauty in one's equations than to have them fit experiment. What do you think on this? Well, it's sometimes better to be uh, wrong in an interesting way than right in a boring way, in, in the sense that the former can sometimes point the way forward. I think that's what he, what Dirac was getting at. And I want to I want to add to what you, Juan, said there about Occam's razor, because I think when we say that a physics theory needs to work, right, what we really mean by that is not just that it should be able to explain all the measurements so far, like all those spectral lines in the book, but that it should also be able to predict new things that we haven't seen yet. And that's where the beauty actually of simplicity really shines. You know, this is well known in machine learning that if you don't insist on having a simple description, you can find a so-called overfitting description, which just memorizes all the data and is useless for predicting. But the, the more beautiful your theory is in the sense of being being a minimalistic, being short, being, 
having little information in it, the more it will generalize to the future. In a sense, uh, there's this free lunch theorem it's well known in complexity theory that says that if someone gives you just a string of random numbers, right, there is no algorithm, there's no computer program with fewer bits of information that can just output that. <clears throat> and so when we find uh, an, a, a way, a physics theory that can describe a lot of data beautifully in one sense, in the sense of in the Occam's razor sense, doing it with much less information, we know that this is just not random data, that we've actually discovered some pattern. And that's where the power of generalization comes from, the power to make new predictions in physics for things that we haven't seen yet. And when you check, you know, wow, the prediction worked. Monsieur, does that sound right to you? That you get as a simple, you get as simple a pos as possible a theory, and you maximize the possibility that it might fit new experimental data? Yes, I think so. And it goes back to when I was in high school, when I was in high school, I was struggling to learn the Schrodinger wave equation, which was horrible. It was ugly. And I said to myself, how can God be so malicious to create the Schrodinger wave equation? And then one day I picked up a book and there was the Dirac equation. Simple, elegant, gorgeous, beautiful. All the, the difficulties summarized into an equation half an inch long, the theory of the electron. And... I began to cry, okay? I've never done that before, crying over an equation. And then I realized there's something hidden there, power, that beauty is not just for beauty's sake. It's power, power to compute things, power to understand the universe. And then when I got into quantum gravity, we have to calculate the scattering of gravitons. And when you do that, the loop diagrams you get diverge. They blow up in your face. And it seemed hopeless absolutely hopeless to create a quantum theory of gravity because every time you calculate the Feynman diagrams, they blow up in your face. And then one day, one day I read a paper where they showed that there are actually two sets of Feynman diagrams. One set of Feynman diagram has, uh, let's say an electron going around and the other one has a super electron going around and they cancel exactly. This to me was a shock. Because it meant that, again, beauty is just not for beauty's sake. It's just not there to be admired and people say, oh, wow, that's pretty. No, it has power. Power to eliminate the divergences. In fact, to our knowledge, the only way known to eliminate the divergences of quantum gravity is through supersymmetry so that superparticles cancel against each other. Such a simple idea. Such a simple idea that has the power to do something that the greatest minds could not do. Many people had given up trying to quantize gravity. Because every time you quantize gravity, it blew up in your face. And there was a the solution. Symmetry. Supersymmetry. The symmetry of particles canceling against their super partners. And of course, we don't have any experimental data concerning this yet. That's an embarrassment. But in my heart of hearts, I think one day we'll find it. So theory is going to lead experiment. That nature is telling us something, that all the divergences of quantum gravity are there for a reason, pointing to the direction of supersymmetry, which to our knowledge is the only way to cancel the horrible infinities in quantum gravity. Sabina Hossenfelder, how are we doing so far? You, you in your opening statement, talked about the importance of contextualizing our ideas of beauty, that different people find, different sort of generations particularly, of people find things beautiful at different times. Um, do simplicity and symmetry, are they always beautiful? Um, are they beautiful from a limited perspective? Are our attachments to simplicity and symmetry perhaps leading us in the wrong way? Or do you think that this is correct, that if we stick with the principles of sim simplicity and symmetry, we will eventually find that our theory does in fact play out experimentally? Well, it just didn't work with supersymmetry, right? So <laughs> I'm not sure there's even that much of a question. Uh, like people have been looking for grand unified theories and supersymmetric particles since the 1980s, and they haven't found them. So clearly it doesn't work. But maybe let me uh, let me come back to the question you asked about uh, Dirac uh, and his statement about beauty. 
because I think Dirac kind of, he became a victim of his own success. So he derived this beautiful equation uh, and he didn't really know why it worked. So he tried to come up with an explanation and I think he stumbled on this idea of beauty. So he started thinking that his sense of beauty was what led to this success and he later tried to use it again and it didn't work for example with his um what did he call it the large number hypothesis um so so it, i found it interesting what huan said about um consistencies or inconsistencies because what dirac was actually doing with his equation was that he was trying to remove an inconsistency between special relativity um and the then known version of the schrodinger equation uh, so he he misidentified the origin of his success, and to some extent, we're still suffering from this today. So string theory was actually an approach to to try and resolve an inconsistency, as uh, Michu uh, co correctly said. Um, to my best knowledge, it was never actually proved that it did indeed resolve the inconsistency. Juan, do you want to come back here and and weigh in? Um. Yeah, well, the, regarding the question, uh, of course, if you take the question out of context, he's, of course, incorrect. What Dirac probably meant was that an interesting mathematical structure might lead to apparent contradiction with experiment, but usually there's a long chain of reasoning in interpreting experiments, so he meant that perhaps it's more likely that there is some error in the chain of reasoning than in the theory. Mm -hmm. Now, it's also true that Dirac said, later in his, said this later in his life, Dirac was trained as an engineer, and for him, it was important that the equations work in the sense that we, we mentioned before. Um, and he was interested in symmetries and general principles. And of course, he had a tremendous success with the Dirac equation and his prediction of the positron. Um, he also suggested the existence of monopoles, which have not yet been seen, but it's quite likely that they, they exist. Um, and Sabine mentioned the fact that the, the variation of the Newton constant with time, that's certainly the case where it didn't work. Now, an interesting example, I think, for this is uh, Young Mills theory. So when Young and Mills proposed the theory, it was uh, supposed to apply for the description of pions, and, and it did not work. Um, but later, it was useful for the development of the standard model. So it applied to the weak interactions and to the strong interactions. Uh, another example is the following. In 1939, in a talk, Dirac said in a talk about the power of mathematics and physics that the group of analytic transformations on the plane, on the two-dimensional plane, uh, was an interesting mathematical subject uh, that might be interesting for physics. He didn't know how. But actually, in the 1980s, this was indeed brought to the study of uh, phase transitions in two dimensions by Belavin, Poliakov, and Samolochikov, and we use it to uh, explain experiments and so on. So that's a case where, you know, some beautiful mathematics then had some implication for um, uh, a third, final, another example of famous mistake that turned out to be useful was when Einstein felt <laughs> it was mathematically elegant to include the so-called cosmological constant in his equations of gravity. And then he later called that his greatest blunder. And now, of course, in hindsight, <laughs> we know... <laughs> he was right there is actually dark energy in our universe and a lot more of it than of the, the kind of atoms that make up us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are there to move into the second theme though um may there be some assumptions that can't be demonstrated experimentally or that won't be demonstrated experimentally um should we accept the idea that some of the assumptions of the foundation of physics for example the idea just that there is a grand unified theory out there um, could be akin to religious convictions are these sorts of assumptions faith dressed up as mathematics um sabina i will start with you well, I guess it depends on what you mean by accept. So should we accept them as established by evidence? No, of course not, because they aren't. Should we accept them as an inspiration that physicists use to develop new hypotheses? Uh, it's fine with me because I'm a very pragmatic person, you know, for what I'm concerned, <laughs> anything goes if something comes out in the end. Uh, but there's there's a risk, you know, that, that people run down uh, dead ends and then stand in front of a wall and uh, look at the beautiful wall <laughs> and we're not getting anywhere. So I think one has to be a little bit mindful of um, 
you know what 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 is faith and and what is actually um science what about you michio do you think that these assumptions say that the notion that there's a grand unified theory has the structure of faith or is it different from faith well personally i think that eventually all things are testable it just means that our instruments have to be souped up to the point where they can reveal the true nature of things for example dark matter we don't know what dark matter is it makes up most of the matter of the universe some people think it is a presence of supersymmetry which is of course the symmetry of the string in particular the fotino when you look at the fotino you find that its properties are what you want that it is massive it has it's not massless and uh, it is uh, invisible and that's exactly what dark matter is if i held dark matter in my hand it would be invisible and yet it would sift right through my fingers we've never seen anything like that before on a stable on a stable canvas of physics but there it is in outer space now that won't clinch string theory but i think it would go a long ways towards showing that supersymmetry is a legitimate physical symmetry of the universe also there are other ways of testing these theories uh when we look at the fact that string theory exists in other dimensions some people laugh and say this is science fiction but already scientists are trying to look at deviations of the inverse square law this goes back to Isaac Newton Newton would say that in your living room gravity diminishes as the inverse square across your living room that has never been duplicated experimentally but on now our instruments are at the point where they can and so we can look for deviations of the inverse square law which would indicate the presence of higher dimensions also satellites in outer space we're talking about lisa laser interferometry space antenna which will give us the best look at creation itself now of course it's very difficult to look at the instant of creation so much radiation existed back then but we hope to get a snapshot of the instant of creation and string theory actually takes you before the big bang string theory does not stop at the big bang it gets you even before the big bang and therefore this gives you a testable parameter by which you can rule out certain string theories if they don't fit the characteristics of the universe as it was being created now of course we cannot measure the universe before creation but the universe at the instant of creation itself i think will eventually be measured by satellites and that will give us a third way to test these theories so in summary i think that yes all great theories can be tested does anybody want to hop in here there are two things that i'm hearing from michio that i think are you go go for it max yeah F first uh, i like to say that um to me the def the core principle of, of science is what is humility uh, I, in, in the sense that i would rather have questions i can't answer than answers i can't question that's what i mean when i say i'm i'm a scientist and that humility includes always being open to the idea that my pet theories are all wrong <clears throat> by as mitch said always testing them testing them testing them uh, I wanted to comment also on on what Michio said about how more and more things become testable and make clear that even if there are some things you cannot test at all that doesn't mean that the the, the theory that that came from itself isn't scientific because what we test in science are theories not a things so for example einstein's theory of gravity is absolutely scientific because it makes a lot of predictions we can test and have tested like michio mentioned but it also predicts what happens inside of black holes which we cannot test and then come back and publish it in the physics journal does that mean relativity is unscientific of course not does it mean we shouldn't trust what general relativity predicts what happens inside of black holes well, as Mitchu said, if, if you want to replace, if you don't like what happens inside black holes, you got to come up with a new theory that that says something different about what happens for the untestable, but that still express explains everything else that we can test, and that's pr pr proven to be super hard. So many of today's biggest controversies in physics, where some people are quick to dismiss them as science fiction, are exactly in this category. For example, 
inflation, the, the most popular theory for what put the bang into our big bang. We don't currently have the technology to go directly measure some as certain aspects of this, but this theory has already made a lot of other predictions that have been very successful. And that's why we take it seriously, but with a humble understanding that it might still be wrong. Same thing, there's been a lot of talk about parallel universes, which a number of you here have, have worked on, that are predicted by inflation, by some variants thereof, or predicted of some variants of quantum mechanics. Uh, again, you can't necessarily go observe that directly, but if you can predict a lot of other things, if you can if you can test a lot of other things predicted by unitary quantum mechanics with no wave function collapse, right? Then you're logically forced to take those things seriously too. So to summarize, I don't think the fact that some predictions of a theory can't be tested at the moment or ever in any way <clears throat> make the theory itself non-scientific as long as it predicts other things that we can test because that means the theory is still falsifiable and we then have to have the humble stance that it might be wrong and just keep testing it well and i hear you're making a distinction perhaps between unadulterated faith and uh something like a, a scientific humility here um as as an answer to this question um yeah, Juan, I mean, the, 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 yeah. the litmus test is unadulterated faith is if someone says that i believe proposition x to be true and there's no data you could possibly give me that's going to change my mind right mm -hmm. whereas the humility that defines science is if you have a if you have something that can be tested you should be able to explain to people which, which test and which data you know will will change your mind and always be open to the idea that that you might be wrong it's important to not get too emotionally attached to our theories mm -hmm. juan how are you doing in here yeah so i think in order to propose a theory we need to make some suppositions so as a theorist you don't have to believe them you just need to assume them until you figure out the consequences so you'll never invent a new theory if you don't start with some assumptions. So for example, you can assume the universal Newtonian law of gravitation, and then you can calculate how planets will move. Now you could assume a different theory of gravity. So for example, you can assume the Nordstrom theory of gravity or the Einstein theory of gravity, and then figure out how planets move. And then in that way, you can uh, figure out which of these theories is correct. Um, you probably never heard about the Nordstrom theory because that's one that is incorrect, but it was certainly one that was proposed at the time. Um, so um, now you you only need to believe them while you are doing the calculation or not even believe them, but you, you just uh, need to logically de deduce from some assumptions. <laughs> now, our current theories are mathematically very complex and it is very difficult to do cal calculations. Even with the even with the theory of the standard model, for example, so this has led to a kind of new breed of theorists. Uh, I think I'm among them uh, who have specialized in the structure of fundamental theories, and uh, um, some have been successfully tested, like the standard model, and some have not. So, uh, for example, string theory is one that has not been uh, tested against uh, nature yet. Um, and we are happy to assume various things at various points. So we are happy to assume grand unification for one research project and not to the next. In one paper, we might assume string theory. In the next, we might only assume semi-classical gravity or only assume inflation. And, uh, you know, inflation doesn't need string theory, so you can only assume inflation and nothing else. Um, and in particular, you don't need to be consistent in your assumptions in the sense that from one paper, you assume one thing and for the next paper, you assume another. So it's not uh, the type of consistency that is required from a politician or moral leader or whatever. So consistency is only required of theories, mm -hmm. uh, not theorists. Um, <laughs> that's now, fascinating. This sort of like, that sort of perspectival approach to it that you work within a particular theory for a particular experimental setup. Is this what you're saying? Yes, yes, for an experimental setup, and you just to to deduce the consequences of those assumptions. You might not. Uh, know exactly what they are because there is a long chain of calculations and you need to compare various theories and so on. Um, now, we, we all have some beliefs, like I think we believe that there is at least one true theory. Um, we also believe or perhaps hope that there are not too many consistent theories so that consistency alone might help us guide us towards the correct theory. If there are so many theories, 
then consistency alone will not be able to guide us to the correct uh, theory by correct, I mean, the one that is described in nature. Um, and also, we hope that the gap between theory and experiment will become smaller. Mm. Um, now, you also mentioned the belief in grand unified theories. There are various things we could mention with this. Uh, first, I first I indeed believe that gravity uh, should be put together with other forces. I think it's not mathematically consistent to have gravity and uh, field theory completely separate there. Matter uh, creates, uh, deforms the structure of space-time, and structure of space-time makes matter move in a different way, so they have to be fit in a consistent mathematical structure. And this is certainly an assumption that we, well, with a strong belief that we have. Mm -hmm. um, now, sometimes people, so it's gravity and quantum mechanics should be unified in this way. Now, sometimes people talk about grand unification in the context of gauge theories. This is a bit more narrow. In this case, it means that there is a very simple, single, big uh, so-called gauge group that somehow breaks into smaller ones we have in the standard model. Now, I think there is a one interesting piece of evidence for this, which is the unification of the couplings. Um, but this is just one numerical coincidence. Maybe it's just a coincidence, but it's an interesting hint. Um, now, is grand unification necessary or always true in our more fundamental theories such as string theory? No, uh, it's not. It depends on the particular geometry of the internal dimensions. But there is a more abstract sense in which gravity and the other in, in interactions are a manif manifestation of the same thing. So in that, in that sense, I think there is some kind of unification. Do you think that's right, Sabina? What is what is the status of this of this belief? This belief that um, gravity and the quantum should be reconcilable. That there should be one theory to to sort of hold everything together. Um, what's the status of that conviction? Is that is that a is that a justified belief? Is it an unjustified belief? Well, it's partly justified in the sense that we do have an inconsistency between general relativity and the quantum field theories of the type that the standard model uses. And this inconsistency has to be removed, resolved somehow by something. That doesn't necessarily mean that you go and quantize gravity. Maybe it's something else entirely, but we need to find some kind of resolution. And yeah, we still haven't found it. Uh, you know, if, if we heard you'd have heard of it. So you're not quite as um, optimistic as Michio is of, of about string theories being the one that's going to do it. Uh, no, I guess not. Um, <laughs> I mean, it hasn't been going all that well for string, th string theory, right? Um, I mean, for what it's uh, resolution of the problem of quantum gravity is concerned. String theory has had some other applications. It was something that uh, Max alluded to earlier. You know, often we find some piece of mathematics and it doesn't work for one thing, but then a couple of decades later, it comes in handy for something entirely different. So um, that's, that's certainly very interesting, but for for what string theory as a theory of everything is concerned, it hasn't been going very well. Just to Me add too. to what, what yeah. Sabina yeah. said there, which is very related to Juan also, you know, the the uh, ADSC correspondence, of course, which uh, uh, Juan invented, shows this beautiful duality between, on one hand, string theory, and on the other hand, more traditional particle physics. Even though I suspect, Juan, that you were motivated by doing it very much because of your interest in string string theory and using particle physics techniques to study string theory, it's as as um, Sab Sabina said, very much been used in the opposite direction now, where people, of course, use your duality to study heavy ion collisions and so on. So basically, using string theory as a tool for solving other problems. This, to me, is yeah, one I, of the. I, I it's also I, very I, I beautiful. Think, I, well, I, th I think I think this shows that string theory is not disconnected with the rest of physics. In fact, in some sense, strings have already been discovered. So strings were discovered before string theory were in, was invented. So they were discovered in hadron collisions. And now, usually, they, they are not called evidence for string theory and so on, but it, it was the reason why string theory was invented. And um, we now think those strings are made out of gluons, out of the particles of strong interactions. Um, but what the duality says is that these two types of string theories, the fundamental string theories and the string theories that are made out of gluons are not fundamentally different. They, they, are, they are similar. And in some theories we can, in some theories with supersymmetry, so supersymmetry is useful for doing calculations sometimes. And so it's like a toy model. And uh, for supersymmetric theories, one can show this in, in great detail. We can, one can do the mathematical computations 
and show how you know chains of gluons turn into strings moving some higher dimension and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I I think so string theory had uh, had successes. I think had success in understanding how uh, you could have perturbation theory. So how you can calculate graviton corrections at higher and higher orders. Um, <clears throat> and um, how it could describe um, certain space-times, negatively curved space-times. But it's not a complete theory yet. So it, we, there are situations we cannot describe. So for example, the beginning of the universe is something we cannot describe yet. So we don't understand how to describe it. So I, I, would, I would call string theory not so much as a theory, but as a theory under construction. So the, the old, let's say, string theory of the 80s is just an approximation to some theory that we think it exists, but we don't know exactly what it is. And Juan, do you think it'll it'll get there? Yeah, I very much hope so. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, but, uh, but I think uh, people are making progress, and we we understanding more aspects now. How much more progress will I think? The most important problem to understand in string theory is the beginning of the Big Bang. This is the most interesting reason, uh, most interesting rationale for studying quantum gravity. And this is something we don't yet know how to describe. And so Max, I, hop in, and then I'd like to hear from Michio after you. Max, go for it. Yeah, just a, one more quick uh, reaction about the question of whether there is a unified theory. Yeah. I think we humility tells us two things here. One, of course, we shouldn't be too confident that the string theory, the unified theory, is going to be this theory, string theory, or loop quantum gravity, or any other particular theory. But I think there's a very good argument that there is a theory that is mathematical and unifies everything, and that you know we are confused right now as physicists about how to put everything together, right? But our universe is not confused whatsoever. It's it keeps doing its thing every day. It obviously works in in some particular way, and as long as that way is also described by by mathematics. Well, that means that there is a mathematical theory out there for us to discover. Oh, wait, hang on a second, though. Does it mean that there's a mathematical theory out there for us to discover? I know I'm like playing right into your, into your, th that there's a mathematical theory out there for us to discover or that we have invented a particularly useful form of mathematics? Well, <clears throat> we mustn't conflate the language of mathematics which is the the words and symbols we use to describe things with with the structure that is being studied. Which could, so if a universe is in fact um, some mathematical structure, you know, Einstein, Einstein thought or it was uh, three plus one dimensional pseudo Riemannian manifold with some tensor field. Quantum mechanics says it's a Hilbert space, etc. If it is something that can be described with, with math, and that's how it operates. Right, then that's very good news for us physicists because it suggests that if we work hard enough, maybe we can actually discover equations which 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 fully captured, and that is a unified theory in the sense that you know maybe one day someone can print a T-shirt or something which which from which you can actually derive both quantum mechanics and gravity and so on. I'm just saying we shouldn't be we should be humble and not assume that we know which theory it's going to be. But there is no... The inconsistencies we have are all in our heads. Uh, that's what I'm saying. They're not in our universe. Our universe doesn't show any sign of being inconsistent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michio, uh, you... I, I, I do... I detect certainly humility from you, but you do seem to know... To think to think that you have a good sense of which theory it's going to be. Um, do, do you think of string theory as a theory under construction, or do you think it's it's pretty close? I think it's pretty close. Um, however, the progress in string theory has been explosive because of the work of, of Juan and ADSCFT. We're talking about taking string theory into a new domain that we never couldn't penetrate before, a non-perturbative domain, a domain where we think on the other side of the fence, there's ordinary quantum field theory, which is amazing. Who would have thought that string theory would have a double identity? One identity is a theory of gravity, and the other counterpart is a theory of ordinary matter. This is incredible. So string theory has had an explosive, absolutely explosive um, interest in the last few years because of that work. However, there are some flies in the ointment. And I think this hasn't been mentioned yet, 
But I think one of the problems of string theory, and even though I promote the theory, is the uh, landscape problem. The theory gives you not just something that very closely approximates our universe, but gives you perhaps an infinity of other universes, a multiverse of universes. Now, of course, Marvel Comics and Hollywood has discovered uh, the multiverse, uh, winner of the Oscars and uh, so on and so forth. But we physicists take this multiverse idea very seriously. And the way we deal with this is usually with computers. For example, when we calculate the mass of quarks interacting with other quarks to create subatomic particles, the human mind is not strong enough or smart enough to do the calculation. We do it by computers with something called lattice gauge theory. And so we've given up trying to have the human mind master the dynamics of the, the quark. We rely on computers. So I think, and this is a long shot, that quantum computers may eventually give us some insight into the true vacuum of string theory. And by that, I mean use the quantum to tease apart the mysteries of the quantum. Digital computers are not powerful enough to probe the different vacua of string theory. So I think that maybe one day a quantum computer will be powerful enough to probe the quantum universes that go into a, uh, a string theory. And just remember that even ordinary quantum mechanics has this problem. Quantum mechanics, that's where the whole pro problem of the multiverse originated from. So we think that something that bedeviled ordinary quantum mechanics will also bedevil string theory. And the ultimate solution may be to use quantum to defeat the quantum. That use quantum computers to gain insight into the true vacua of string theory. That's fascinating. Um, so to take that to transition to our, our final theme and question, um, we keep, it seems, at, at its limits, at the limits of uh, theoretical physics in particular, um, coming up against assumptions on the one hand and conclusions on the other hand uh, that may in fact remain untestable. Um, things like the very existence of a grand unified theory, whether there might be one out there or not. Um, the notion of one kind of multiverse or another kind of multiverse, a quantum multiverse, a string theoretical multiverse, the inflationary multiverse, are these the same multiverses? Um, what happens inside black holes? Um, what happens, what, what, what exactly does inflation look like? Um, there may be some uh, persistent untestabilities here. Um, does this untestability to your mind undermine the, pro the, the, the project of physics, uh, or does it strengthen it? And Juan, we will start here with you. Well, I, I think when we talk about physics in general, I mean, most of physics is based on tested theories and contact with experiment and so on. I mean, here we're talking about the search for the next layer, so the unknown fundamental laws of physics. And I think for this, the most important thing we could do is to continue the experimental exploration. So the, the construction of more powerful accelerators, reaching higher energies, better telescope, the telescopes that see further into the universe, including gravity wave detectors and so on. And they're also interested in small scale experiments, searching for new particles from axions to dark matter and so on. <clears throat> now, so what, what we are talking about here is just a very uh, an aspect of fundamental theory, and in particular, the aspect that has to do with quantum gravity which uh, is very hard to test experimentally with our uh, current and future, near future experiments. Um, however, it's a clear inconsistency in our present understanding. So we could hope that by only the consistency criterion, we could make some progress. Um, it's something that had worked in the past with, uh, let's say, Maxwell's equation, so with general, the development of general relativity. Uh, but that's, uh, that's what we are talking about here, going to very high energies much higher than the ones we could reach in the uh, near future. Perhaps perhaps if we understood the theory well enough, then we would be able to make a prediction that we could test perhaps through some cosmological uh, observation. But as we said, that our theories are not understood well enough to, to make these predictions. Um, so I, I think in general, we are, we are making uh, progress towards the development of this theory based on just consistency. Um, and there are various ideas people bring in. Um, I mean, sometimes uh, the ideas sometimes come out of 
can, are not directly related to string theory. So for example, there was a recent uh, development about uh, holography using uh, the so-called Sash de Viekitaev model. So it's a model that was inspired by condensed matter physicists. And we were talking before about symmetries. And one interesting aspect about this model is that it's based on disorder, random interaction. So the complete lack of symmetry. So it's completely the opposite philosophy. But the, the model itself develops a kind of order or symmetry uh, out of the interactions. So it's a, it's a, it's a new idea that uh, people are exploring and uh, we're exploring. It's somehow connected with other ideas in string theory, but it's not directly related. But this is an example of how uh, looking, uh, how we are looking, an example of the methods we are using to looking for the theory, finding general principles and taking ideas from other areas of physics also. What do you think, Sabina? Are we getting are we getting closer here? Are we are improved technologies going to help uh, root out some of the you know the limits that we have come across? Um, going to improve testability, things like that. Uh, yes, but probably not in the way that uh, Juan <laughs> envisions it. Um, so, but first, I want to say something else. Uh, so, Michu, he said we physicists take the multiverse very seriously. <laughs> Uh, I would like to object. Uh, I don't take it seriously. Uh, and I'm pretty sure if you took a representative sample of all physicists and you asked them about it, you'd find that most of them don't take it seriously. Uh, I wanted to say this because uh, because the, the sample of physicists you see in events like this or that you hear talking uh, on the media or something does not give you a good impression of what most physicists actually work on. Um, so, um, when it comes to new technology, um, I think where we're going to see the most progress come from is probably quantum technology, because there's such a lot going on there, like with quantum computing, quantum optics, uh, quantum information, uh, quantum metrology, quantum sensing. Uh, there's so much going on. I think sooner or later, they'll just stumble over something that they don't understand. And then, then they'll come and ask the, the theorists, uh, how do you explain that? Uh, and, and then I, I think from there on, uh, we, we'll develop our new theory. It, it goes together with my belief that it's a mistake to try to put the blame on gravity when it comes to the unification of uh, Einstein's theory and uh, quantum theory. People have tried to doctor around with uh, gravity, try to quantize it. I think our problem is that we don't really understand the quantum part of the question. So this is why I think uh, this new technology is, is going to help us make progress happen again in the foundations of physics. Fantastic. Um, well, it sounds like even if you uh, disagree, perhaps, on the status of the multiverse, um, you're both uh, hopeful that quantum computing is going to help get us uh, past some of these some of these impasses. Well, thank you all so much. This has been a really wonderful conversation. Um, please join me in thanking our speakers. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.